Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real joy to be with you this morning and to have the privilege and honor of sharing from God's Word. We never take it lightly. We always see it as that which is by divine appointment. And again, in unworthiness we come, uh, trusting in the blessed Holy Spirit to give the interpretation and inspiration of the Word to our hearts afresh. So uh, it's a privilege to be with you. And may the Lord give to each one of you a wonderful, wonderful new year as we seek to go forward. <clears throat> the theme or the word that I want to share with you this morning is that last sentence in verse 4. For you have never been this way before. It's nearly 10 years now since my wife and I came to live in Canada. We lived and were brought up and reared in South Africa. And we had many, many wonderful years of living and ministering in that country and many other countries around the southern parts of Africa. And then came the time of decision. And our eldest daughter had moved here, as she said, to the promised land. And uh, she invited us to come and spend our last days with her here. It took a certain amount of thinking and praying and decision-making, and coming to the realization that that was where God was leading us, and then started all the preparations, the applications for getting into this great country. Then came the packing and the goodbyes, and finally getting on that plane and flying over to Canada meeting with the custom officials, answering all their questions, seeing that our passport was correct, and finally arriving and settling here. And, you know, as we, th as we think back and as we have thought back upon this, we can identify with these very words that were spoken by Joshua to the children of Israel as they were about to enter the promised land. You have never been this way before. For us, it was a whole new experience. And maybe there are folks here also, I'm sure many, who can resonate with the fact how that there came that transition from one nation or one land to another. The children of Israel were standing there with all sorts of thoughts going through their minds in preparation. And you know, in a similar way, we are embarking on a brand new year, 2024. 20, 23 is behind us. Paul said, forgetting that which is behind, we press toward the mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. It comes a time when we have to forget about the past. Some of our past accomplishments, some of our past joys, some of the mistakes we made in 2023, some of the faults that we made. And there were some of those times when we did very well, but we have to forget them as well. And we're almost in a similar situation as the children of Israel embarking on what was called the unknown. Yet the promises had been given to them. And so Joshua was now the man who was going to not only prepare them, but lead them on and through into the land flowing with milk and honey. And you know, we can relate this as well to our spiritual journey. 
And so I want to hang the message this morning on three important words that relate to the passage, relate to us in the new year, and, of course, relate to us in our spiritual journey. Number one, it was certainly a crisis. As I mentioned to you, when we decided to pack up, spent a whole year, 70 years in South Africa, born and bred there. It was a crisis time to move, I can assure you, and many have found the same as they've moved, maybe, as immigrants here. And if you look at the children of Israel, look where they'd come from. They'd come from the land of bondage, the land of Egypt. They'd come through the wilderness because of their disobedience. Instead of going directly through to the land of Canaan, they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness until finally this day came for them to prepare to enter into the promised land. Look at some of the experiences they had had. They'd had the remarkable experience, of course, of being free from the bondage of the Egyptians and Pharaoh. Then came that unbelievable experience at the Red Sea. The impossible situation. Two million Jews. The Red Sea before them. Behind them were the Egyptians. On either side was the desert. And how were they going to get out of this situation? And they even started with their first bout of complaining and longing back for Egypt. And then God miraculously delivered them through the Red Sea. They came into the wilderness, and there were all sorts of experiences that they went through in the wilderness, as you will well remember. One of the remarkable experiences was at the foot of Mount Sinai. I don't know if you've been there. It's been my privilege to have been there several times. To look at this massive hit mountain. The Bible tells us, if you read the occasion, how that there was thunder and lightnings and smoke and as all sorts of things were happening as God was delivering His commandments for the children of Israel to become a nation that lived under law and order. And then there was the experience when they had no food. And again, of course, they had the ability and the gift to complain. And so they said, Lord, Moses said, what are we going to do? And God provided in manner in all that they needed. There came a time when there was rebellion and the snakes put some of them to sleep. You'll remember that. There another time they sent spies into the land of Canaan, 12 of them. And 10 of them came back absolutely negative. This is not the country for us. There are giants there. We, 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 we feel as if we're nothing like little grasshoppers. And only two said, no, no. What an opportunity God has given to us. They'd come a long way. A generation had virtually passed. And now in the crisis moment of putting the past behind them, they were approaching the promised land. I'm sure everyone here this morning can identify with crisis. Life is filled with crises. Some crises are wonderful. Marriage was a wonderful crisis. Amen? A few men have just said it. A few ladies are hesitant, but amen? <laughs> what about when the first children came? Amen? But listen, when you're a grandparent, even better. <clears throat> amen? I've got five grandchildren. Three of them, or two of them are in, uh, in, in Australia, and the others here. 
But they're wonderful crises. But you know, there are some crises in life that are not so good. And I've stood, as some of you have stood by the bedside and watched loved ones passing on. And the crisis of going through the valley of the shadow of death is never an easy crisis. There is another crisis that you may have, and I hope all have experienced, and it's called the crisis of the new birth. The new birth is nothing other than what Jesus came to procure for us at the cross of Calvary when he died that our sins may be forgiven and that we may come to the point in our lives, the crisis moment, when our lives are in encounter the living Christ and the past is forgiven and a brand new life is put before us. It's called the crisis of the rebirth. In fact, the Lord Jesus explained that one day very graphically to a man called Nicodemus. We call him Nicky today. And the Lord Jesus said something very strange. Nicodemus came as a, in a very diplomatic manner. He said, uh, good master, we know that you are a man sent from God because no one can do the miracles that you do <clears throat> except they be from God. He certainly knew how to flatter and open up the lines of diplomacy. Jesus cut him short. Eh? He said, listen, buddy. Except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. You need a crisis, my man. You need to know what it means to be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. You had to learn that if you're born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once. Amen? That's the new life, the crisis that we are brought to in our lives when we encounter Jesus and our lives are changed forever. Hallelujah! That's the message of the gospel. And if you've never experienced that and you've doubted it and questioned it and so on, let me urge you by faith to come to that place where you admit that you're a sinner and you open up your heart as you repent of your sin. And receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And a brand new life opens to you. It's the crisis that never ends in the journey that is given to us. Amen. Now number two, not only do we notice here that there was a crisis, but it certainly came with a challenge. A challenge. He said to them, they all would have nodded their heads, I'm sure, you've never been this way before. They'd been in the wilderness, all right. They'd been in Egypt. They knew all those things. But here was a brand new challenge to life that they'd never experienced before. And you know, there's a number of things that a person can do with challenges. We have various challenges in life. You might have a new, new job or university coming up or something new happening or marriage and so on and, and the church is going through new plans and so on. There are many challenges. And there's a good way to handle challenges and there's a bad way to handle challenges. I don't know what they are in your life, but you know. Number one, when there is a challenge... We need to learn to accept the challenge that is before us. You see, for the children of Israel, they were having to accept that this was a brand new environment. They'd been nomads. They'd been wandering around in the wilderness. They'd made all sorts of mistakes and God was having to chastise them and teach them. Now they were being called to become a new nation. 
in a new land. And this demanded a tremendous change and challenge in their lives. You know, when we came to this beautiful country of Canada, we were faced with some challenges. <clears throat> One of the challenges we faced was that here, everybody drives on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> we drive on the left side in South Africa, like in England and Australia. But here, you all drive on the wrong side, as far as we are concerned. <laughs> I learned it very, very well when I made one or two blunders when I started to drive here. I had been driving for 50 years. And they said, you've got to get a license. I said, I know how to drive. They said, you've got to be a li do a license. I said, I don't need to. I've been driving for 50 years. Why must I get a license? They said, that's the law of the land. You have to accept the challenge of driving on the other side of the road. <laughs> and you know, when you become a Christian, immediately you receive challenges. And challenges become very real. Let me tell you some of the challenges you receive when you become a Christian. Number one, you get a new boss. Okay? Up until that crisis is negotiated. You are the boss of your life. You make your own decisions without consulting anyone. You feel you've got the answers. Then, when you receive Jesus Christ into your life, you suddenly realize that at best you're still a sinner. That all your righteousness are as filthy rags. And you need someone better stronger, wiser to take the controls of your life. And you bow in submission to the new boss. And his boss, the boss's name is the Lord Jesus. Number two, you receive a new name. And the name that you receive, apart from your surname, is becoming a Christian. What does that mean? A Christ follower. Before you followed your own ideas and the way of the world and how the world thinks. Now you become a, have a new name because you are following the Lord Jesus Christ. You develop, thirdly, a new lifestyle. The way of the world is a way of all sorts of ups and downs. The way of the world captures the imagination of those who want to be worldly in their ways. And the habits of the world and the pleasures of the world that are temporal and all that the world has to offer and that fizzles away very easy and at the end of the road there's nothing to offer you. What shall he profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But when you become a Christian, the new challenge comes upon you on a new way of behavior. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. That's the new life. What a challenge. And every day I'm learning new challenges in this journey in following, following the Lord Jesus. I also receive a new language. And the Bible's got a name for that. Do you know what the name is? I speak the language of Zion. The world's got its own language. It's got bad language. Child of God has a different language. And it comes out. And there's holy reverence in the way we're using the name of Jesus now. And not as a swear word. It's a brand new language. And we sing the songs out of praise. Because of the language that is birthed in us. By God's Holy Spirit. To make us children of God that are joyous and happy. Of course, I have a new family. 
My family is extended right around the world. Everywhere I go, I have the joy of meeting new believers. My job is to preach in different churches almost every Sunday. I've got to preach another service this afternoon. I'm meeting a whole new group of people, and they love the Lord Jesus. Then I'll go next week to another group and so on. And I find there are believers everywhere. I've got a huge family, and so are you, have you, when you know Jesus. I've met with some people and they sing a song. I can't understand a single word they're singing. But I can sense their hearts. And the Spirit unites us together. That's the family spirit of being part of the family of God. Isn't that lovely? It's worth an amen, eh? Amen? And then, of course, I get a new home. I think we sing that song, This world is not my home. This is temporal, man. What you think is important here is unimportant to what's coming. Because Jesus said so. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, so that where I am, there ye may be also. My friends, the best is yet to be. Your castles that you build here are nothing in comparison uh, to the heavenly home prepared by the Lord Jesus in a place called heaven. I get a new song. It's called the song of victory. Song of praise. The song of worship. Sometimes I tell some folks, please just tell your face about it, man. Let's be happy. And let's be smiling because that's the joy of a song in our hearts singing praise even unto our God. And by the way, those songs, whoever led them, they were beautiful. Thank you very much. What a blessing to sing those great old hymns of faith. Amen. So there is the acceptance. I am a new, brand new person in Christ Jesus. And they were going to have to accept that as they were going to cross the Jordan. They were going to have to find themselves accepting the new land and the new place and the new destination and the new inheritance that was due to them because of what God had prepared for them. What did the Bible say? Paul say, I have not here heard, seen, nor ear heard what God has prepared for those that love him. What a hope that we have as far as God's children are concerned. Now, in this challenge, not only is there acceptance, but there comes what we call the formulating, formulation. What does that mean? Well, it takes planning. It takes discipline. And remember, the children of Israel were not really a, a, a well-defined army. They were, as I said, nomads. Now they were going to come in and they were going to possess the land. They were going to take over the land. This was going to take a whole new lifestyle and challenges as far as they were concerned. And you know what? They were never going to do it in their own strength. And that's what I love about this passage. And I want you to look at chapter 3. And we find uh, Joshua is addressing them. He calls them together. And in verse 5 he said, Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, to, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That word sanctify is a lovely word. In the reading it was consecrate yourself. It means set yourself apart. Sanctify, allow the Holy Spirit to give you a brand new heart that has affections that are above and not below. It calls for holiness of living. It calls for a contrite spirit. It calls for a heart where there's no room for pride and jealousy and envy and anger, and so we can go down the line. It calls for a holiness of heart and life. Listen, they could have been the best equipped army in the world. But if their hearts weren't sanctified, if they weren't set aside, if they weren't putting God first, if Matthew 6.33 wasn't really in their lives, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, they would never have prospered in the promised land. There was the need to be set aside. 
My friends, that's the secret. That's the challenge. Allow God to set you aside. You're not going to say, now I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that. No, God does it. It's He who works in me both to will and to do of His own good pleasure. God's at work. I've just got to allow Him to operate on me. And me stop trying to rectify my life. Yield to Him. And He's given us the blessed Holy Spirit to correct us and guide us and convict us and lead us and give us all that we need in understanding the wonderful truths of being a follower of the Lord Jesus. So we're going to face this new year. What's going to happen? It's not going to be roses all over the place. It's going to be tough times. There's going to be severe challenges maybe, maybe more, more than we ever had. How are we going to handle it? God gives us His Holy Spirit and He comes to breathe into our lives new hope. And so He challenges them. There's the challenge to accept, formulate your life. And thirdly, there's the challenge to proceed. To proceed. You see, there was going to be no welcome committee for them on the other side of Jordan. The Canaanites were not going to welcome them with open arms by any means. There was going to be the need to proceed. And while it might have been convenient to stay where they were, God was calling them to face all that it would mean in the promised land. And there were two major things they were about to face. Number one, of course, there was the River Jordan. The River Jordan was swollen, they said, in flood. Some said it was a mile wide. Here's two million Jews having to cross. It's almost a physical impossibility. And they well stood there and said, Joshua, how are we going to do it? Joshua said, you've got small memories. You've got small memories. Do you remember what happened with the Red Sea? Oh, yes, we remember. Well, what about the Jordan? And you can negotiate the Jordan, my friends, or people, not by yourselves, but because of the one who has said, I will go before you. And then, straight after the crossing the Jordan, which must have been quite a thing, there was the imposing city of Jericho. The Bible tells us it was well fortified. They were well groomed in knowing now how to defend the city. And the ridiculous thing was that God said, I'm going to tell you how you can destroy Jericho. You're going to fight them in an unorthodox manner. You're not going to come with all your weapons of warfare that you think you, would be necessary. No, you're going to walk around the city. In fact, you're going to walk around seven times. And while you walk around the seven times, they're going to laugh at you. They'll even take some pot shots at you. They'll think you're ridiculous and you'll wonder, what are we doing walking around? This is not how you fight. And on the seventh day, to crown it all, you're going to walk around seven times and blow the trumpet and see what happens. You see, God's ways are not our ways. God's got his own way of bringing things about if you and I will just take our hands off it. And so... Jericho, the walls, fell, the walls fell flat, not just because of the ingenuity of the children of Israel, but because of the fact that God had told them, I will provide. Amen? And that's what it is, my friends. God works in unorthodox ways to bring me to the place of total trust. I don't know what your Jordan may be. I don't know what your Jericho may be. It could be something impossible or it could be something imposing. And humanly speaking, there is no possible way of being handled to be able to handle the Jordan. And I don't know how we're going to handle Jericho. Lord, we need you. We need you. My friends, that's how we're going to get through 24. We don't know what's going to happen. The world's in a total mess. But there's a group of people called God's people elect from all the nations of the world, 
redeemed with the blood of Christ, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and made ready for the wonders of heaven, that the Lord God will lead us on and take care of us. The children of Israel should have known that. They'd be led by the pillar of fire, remember, in the clouds. Same God had led them will bring us in across our Jordans and across in, in confronting our Jerichos that we may be more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Which brings us thirdly to the fact that it calls for commitment. So there was a crisis. There was a challenge, no doubt about that. There was a commitment that the Lord was asking of them. And the commitment was several fold. Number one, it was to the promises of God. You see, it says in verse uh, 7, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that you may know that, that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You see, they were ha having to accept a new leader. And that wasn't easy because Moses had been the epitome of what God would want as a leader. He was called the meekest man who ever lived. Somebody said that's because he lived with his mother-in-law for 40 years. Well, I didn't think that was necessarily the only reason. <laughs> but Moses was all in all to them. Now they've got to follow Joshua. And the, the God that called Moses at the burning bush put his hand upon Joshua and called him to gather the people together. And they went through on a promise. On a promise. You see, my friends, the Christian life is a life that is built on promises. And when you get a promise from God, write it down. Wrap your life around them. Stand upon the promise. Claim the promise. And there's a God in heaven who will honor the promise that he gives to you. You can take my Bible every day. I look for a promise. The minute I get it, I write a date next to it. I write it down on a card. I put it on my desk somewhere. It's a promise. I'm not going forward today on my feelings. I'm not going forward piggyback on somebody else's faith. I've got a promise that God's given me for today. And I hold on to it. And the promises are there for us to claim that yea and amen. Secondly, not only the promises, but they were going to have opportunities. They were going to have opportunities to prove God at every point. They could stand at the end of the Jordan and they put up stones to record the fact that they'd crossed the Jordan. They were going to see Jericho falling flat and answers of prayer there. They were going to have to deal with the sin of Achan and later on with others as the various situations came. And God was going to give them the opportunity of establishing themselves as tribes into a new nation, into a new country, that they would become a people that could be reckoned with. God would not be God if he didn't give you opportunities to prove him in this new year. And I'm sure if I had to give a testimony, ask for a testimony meeting this morning, there are many that can testify how God helped us last year. Amen? The same God, the same God who helped you last year will help you this year. When we moved to come over here, we had to sell our, 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 our place where we were living, our home, and, uh, and there it was very difficult. And someone said, well, how, how, how are you going to move? You've got days to go and you've got to get rid of your house. What are you going to do? And you can't lose too much because you're going to need the money on that side. <laughs> and I said, well, the same God who called us is the God who will provide for us. That's the God that we serve. And if that's the God that we serve, my friend, we better get to know him intimately. We need to understand his heartbeat, his mind, his will, his purposes, and live in accordance to the opportunities. He may be giving some wonderful opportunities to this church in the new year. And you know, the old devil comes along and says, well, we're living in bad times. We can't take steps of faith. My dear friends, trust him when the opportunities come in. 
There'll be opportunities to witness for him. That's why we're here. In this whole world, as God's children, to be witnesses. Take the opportunities. Make the opportunities. And you'll prove your commitment to him. And then thirdly, there was a command. And the command was to step out. Even though it doesn't seem too easy. If God made everything easy, and we could just switch God on whenever we wanted to, my friend, there, there would be no joy in that. The joy is trusting Him every single day and seeing God bring you through. Now we're going to have to make a commitment to change. As I said, we have to make a commitment coming to this country to change the lifestyle. Some things I couldn't change. I couldn't change my uh, way of speaking, maybe. But other things we had to change, and how we lived and so on. And then there was the commitment to the leader, to Joshua. It's no good saying, well, we like old Mo Moses so, long, so much. Who's this guy? We're not going to listen to him. Oh, no. They had to change as far as leadership was concerned. And there's a far greater leader than Moses and Joshua. His name is Jesus, my friend. You can go into this year without Jesus. You can try and handle your little craft of life without Jesus. And you'll bump your head and bump your head and bump your head. And you'll bear the results. But if you take Jesus as your leader, you'll bow before him every day. And say, Lord, I'm reporting for duty. You're in charge of my little life. I fail many times. I fall down, but you pick me up. You open up opportunities. You meet my need. And gradually, as the children of Israel had to come into the promised land and take up that new, see the new leadership that was been given to them, so in God's wonderful economy, by His Spirit, He helps us to be like Jesus. So let's conclude the message. I think there's one word that wraps up this entire message, and as far as the children of Israel were concerned, it's the word faith. They didn't sit there and have a map of the whole country mapped out in front of them. They had no TV to tell them what it was like in the promised land. They didn't even have binoculars to see what it looked like. Everything they did was by faith, was by faith, was by faith. You know what the Bible says about God's people? It says, the just shall live by faith. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, in case you don't know how to spell it. Eh? Forsaking all I trust Him. Amen? Stop clinging to the things of this world and put your faith and trust in Him. And He will see you through. They were going to enjoy an inheritance. Inheritance that was pure and holy in which God was well pleased. It's a brand new year, folks. Don't mess it up. Make it be God-honoring. When you fail, admit it. Stand up again. Keep going. You heard the story of the two frogs that fell into the jar of milk. And the one frog said, I'm never going to get out of this. He took a big gulp and he drowned. The other frog said, no, I'm going to get out of this. And he kicked and he kicked and he kicked and he kicked and kicked and turned the milk round and round and round. And guess what? It came to butter. And he walked out of it. That simple, silly little story, but absolutely true. You can drown in the way of the world. Or you can, be, you can be someone who says, no, I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. And I'm going to see what he can do. And the very things that would perhaps pull me down or drown me, I'll walk over because of Jesus Christ. That's the difference. And that's why we are called God's special people. Let us bow in prayer.